moment. I got ambushed today by everybody. I just needed a moment. I wasn't dealing well. I went to my... I wasn't happy place. It was just my office. So I had to get to work. Yes, right now. Do it again. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Wasn't that an amazing call to worship? Thanks so much, Colby. All right. Let's go ahead and stand up. Um, Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Okay, ready guys? Once a sinner far from Jesus, I was perishing with cold. But the blessed Savior heard me when I cried. Then he threw his robe around me and he led me to his home. And I'm living on the hallelujah Sing the Savior's praises far and wide For I've opened up toward heaven all the windows of my soul And I'm living on the hallelujah side Not for all, oops, sorry For the sun is always shining and his sky is always bright Tis no place for gloomy Christians to abide is a joyful song and I feel like we're just singing a funeral dirge let's get on this guys that's I said enter his presence with singing 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 Psalm 100 enter his presence with singing come on guys we're living on which which side are we living on no what side are we living on hallelujah side. what side are we living on Woo, let's do this once a sinner far from Jesus, I was perishing with cold. But the blessed Savior heard me when I cried. Then he threw his arms around me and he led me to his home. And I'm living on the hallelujah side. Oh, glory. Oh, glory be to Jesus. Christians to 
we go. There we go. They just want to know what's next is all. Just, yeah. Brethren, we have met to worship. seated. Um, Pastor Stan has us um, looking towards small groups this coming fall, and that song just kind of talked about how, what it means to be part of the family of God in small groups and how we care for one another. Our um, announcements this morning, next Sunday begins um, the new Sunday school curriculum, the new classes, and also the, for the first time, I believe, ever at New Trail an adult Sunday school class, so we're pretty excited about that. Yes, if, um, if that is something you plan to attend, um, would you see Marshall, Brant, um, Paul, and just kind of give them your name so that we know how many we're to plan for for that, and it'll be at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Discipleship begins at home, that conference on Friday and Saturday will be here this coming weekend. Um, I have added to our Facebook the new link. If you're going to come, I really would appreciate numbers on that. Keep going. And then uh, on the 18th, the following week, we have Dr. Jim Rankin, Adventures in Truth, here with us. He has new information to bring, and it's always just a great time of learning. And then the following week, Tim Stewen will be here, we believe, on Saturday. More to come, and definitely on Sunday morning as well as our send-off for Pastor Stan and Beth with a meal and shooting. I, I'm not going to qualify, just shooting. 
Anyway, so there we go, Pastor Stan. I tell you what, I am really looking forward to going, but I hope it's not to heaven yet. <laughs> hey, good morning, New Trail. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning, and we're glad to have you here on a good Sunday. I know it's Labor Day weekend, but we're glad you're here this morning because you're here to grow, learn, and know who the Lord is today. And I think it's an awesome thing that we see what God wants to do through you. The Bible tells us that the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Folks, you better be here with a gratitude of heart saying, God, I want to know more about you. That's what it's about, isn't it? And we grow in Christ and know who he is, and we grow in that. Like I said, it's good to be here this morning. I'm glad you're here. We're here to worship the Lord. We're here to give him focus, give him our praise. And by the way, let me say something. You're not here to get. You're here to give. I know some of you, that's, I, heard, I heard two or three amens, and that's right. You know what? I think too long we've been coming here. What can we get? Because you come to hear the preaching or something else. You're here for the wrong reason. We're here to give praise to the Lord. Amen. That's what it's about. If you come in here to critique and everything else and to find, I hope I get something. Because you know what? This is the day when you have issues, you lay them at the foot of the cross. You should do it every day. But sometimes we need to come with the family. Somebody might come along and say, you can say to them, man, I'm having a tough time. And you know what the family's here for? To encourage you. Let's say, let's give it to the Lord today. Let's pray with you. Let's, let's encourage you. That's what it's about. And that's to where we go then, to the Lord with it. So, folks, today, if you're here to get, can I ask you very graciously, would you go out the door, check your attitude outside, and come back in, being ready to give to the Lord? Is that a good word? An encouragement. And just want you to be that way. We're here to give to the Lord. That's what true worship is. Because as I just heard this past week, there are three types of worship that we often do. One is ignorant worship improper worship and idolatry worship and you say in the church yes how do we idolatry sometimes you focus on the pastor too much that's idolatry I'm gonna be gone for three months praise the Lord for your benefit I mean that praise the Lord for your benefit you know why it's a time for us you to grow I hear other voices. Let others lead. Be part of things. It is encouragement. And encourage each other. Isn't that good? You say, well, I don't know. I, I kind of like Pastor Stan. Well, guess what? You're going to like Brother Paul. In fact, when I show up next time, when I come back in January, you're going to say, who is the goon that's standing in the pulpit today? <laughs> and, and the bottom line is this. You're going to say, fact is, we were blessed, but it wasn't about what you heard it's about what you gave to the Lord and God will give a part of himself to you I want to encourage you this morning that's why it says here let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another through the various ways that God calls to do that so this morning may we be focused that way let's pray shall we Father Lord we're here to meet you face to face and to know your heart and to hear your heart as we seek after you with own heart Lord, I pray you be with each one of our family today as we're here to give you what's ourselves. Because you give yourself on the cross to your son, Jesus Christ. Because you loved us so much and we're called to give back to you because of what so much was done for us. And we cannot outgive you and Lord, thank the Lord we can't. But we're here to give that as our, our voices, our heart, even our issues of, in the joys of happening. Lord, we just pray you bless and give, we give you every part of ourselves to you as we give worship to you. We thank you, Lord, for God's, your wonderful grace to us that we have the privilege that we can come to your presence and give of ourselves to you. So, Lord, whatever issues we have, we say, here. And then we can say, Lord, my spirit is free to give you what you need to hear. Maybe, Lord, in our own hearts, we need to blow the shofar and declare our praise to you individually. We pr thank you for what, God, you're doing through us. In Jesus' name we pray. And what you're going to do. And God's people said, amen. amen. Let's praise the Lord in song. Go ahead and stand up. 
I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this song. I'm a part. Zechariah 12 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. And then it goes on to say that on that day there shall be a fountain. It's a fountain opened up for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Beneath that flood, lose 
Thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. from us by the blood of your son Jesus we're grateful and we praise you for it we give you all of this because we know as we've said before in recent days the word says in Romans 5 you loved us so much that you <laughs> you gave yourself up for us to die for us to redeem us from our sins because we couldn't do anything on our own so Lord thank you for what you've done for us we might simple be human frail people but yet by you we're mighty because of the blood poured out for us from that fountain, the fountain of your body. We thank you for it, we praise you for it, and we give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray, God's people said, amen, amen and amen. You may be seated as we come this morning. I'm going to do something I don't usually do from the pulpit, but I will do it here. Brother Paul, I want you to assist this morning as well, and Larry, I want you as well, okay, in just a moment to help us communion. And Dusty will help you as well. I want to say something. The fact is, granted, and we have my grandkids here today. I want to tie in with what we're about to do. My grandson, our oldest, has been blasting around our house the last 36 hours. Because <laughs> he's learned to play the horn. I hate to say this, but as I was given a gift of a shofar, this boy doesn't know how to blow it. But the young man, when he had there, the day he got it, I got it, he could blow it. I said, boy, you've got the right lips, you've got the right lung capacity, you've got it all. And I thought this morning, I thought, you know what? What better way to bring us together and to call us into worship by the shofar? Because someday we're going to hear the shofar of old shofars. God's going to blow the great trumpet and he's coming again. Amen? Amen. And I thought I'd do it, but also you realize the shofar was used for many things in the understanding of worship and of Israel. One is when they were offering sacrifice, they called people to the sacrifice of the shofar that was given. They also called by the shofar to war. They called by the shofar of that when they wanted to have an assembly. If you read Nehemiah, the fact is you don't read about the shofar there, but it was understood that probably when Nehemiah wanted to have the word read, they blew the shofar so people could hear the word of God and called them there. This morning, we had a shofar call to get us focused. And one thing I'll say to you, 
We're glad you're here to worship. We're glad you want to visit with each other. But you know what? You notice what got your attention this morning? The shofar. And you immediately quieted down. We're here to worship. The shofar brought us to that presence. And I'll say to my grandson, even if it was somebody else, thank you, Colby, for doing it for us this morning. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we might just have to do a little more. Anybody else blow the shofar? <laughs> and so, but, uh, but we come around the communion table. We've been called to worship. Why well, have the privilege to worship the Lord this morning? Because somebody made the way, named Jesus, for us to have the opportunity to come face to face to him because he came face to face to us. Isn't that wonderful? We have that in Christ Jesus. We're blessed to be that kind of a people this morning, to be in the presence of the Lord because he wanted to be with us and to buy us back and to have a relationship with us. And that's why, as Elise has kind of pointed us already to the point of a couple of songs we've sung, where we're talking and preaching about that understanding of why we need growth groups, that we know why we've become whole groups, whole growth groups, whatever, discipleship groups, those times that we come together because we're called to get into intimacy with Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. But one of the, it had to start somewhere. And you know where it started? It started at the cross. It restarted in heaven. Because God had the plan already made there for us. And he came here for us. He loved us that much. So if my brothers would come right now as we get ready to share together in the share of communion around the bread and the cup. Larry, if you'll take outside and Paul will take out here and Dusty will take the middle. Would you go ahead and Paul, you want to assist in getting things ready here? Be sure to get the bread first. There we are. I know they're on top of things. But we have newer people this morning helping. But as it, they're focusing on this. I like it just for a moment, just to be quiet. Sometimes I've already given a scripture from Colossians. Would you this morning just be quiet before the Lord and just dwell upon Him and give Him your praise from your heart? I don't care if you pray out loud. I don't care if you express out loud or if you just do it in your heart. I think we need to come with a heart that's reunited. And we say, Lord, I give, I give myself to you because of what you gave so much for me. Would you just right now, right now in the quietness and while Lisa's playing, just thank the Lord for what he's done by a broken body and he shed blood for you. Would you do it right now? Just be quiet. I'm going to be quiet. You just worship the Lord before him. right now kind of with maybe we come to church kind of in a rush we're kind of harried all worked up maybe a little not as relaxed as we should be calm our hearts lift our eyes to look as the Bible says into the hills from which comes my help my help comes from the Lord remind us of what we have through Jesus Christ Help us to set aside our personal agendas. Remind us we're not here to talk about our, our, our crops. We're not here to talk about our jobs. We're not here to talk about our vehicles. We're not here to talk about the job and what we don't like about it or what we do like about it. We're not here to talk about our grandkids. We're really here to talk to Jesus and let you speak to us. And we thank you that we have the privilege that we can come to you and talk with you and you with us. Now, Lord, as we pass this bread and this cup, reminding us of what your son did for us by identifying with us personally 
understood every ache and pain, every traumatic hurt, every word that was spoken that was meant to wound us. You heard it all. But you said you're more than conquerors through me, through Jesus Christ. And the ultimate conquering was that of conquering sin as you did by your shed blood on the cross for us. We thank you for that this morning. Let's celebrate that, Lord. Help us to remind us that we have everything to give above, up of ourself, that you can increase within us. We love you with all our hearts this morning. Speak to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you ask as the bread comes by, as they pass it, just to hold it until we share together, and the same will be done with the cup. Let the brothers pass the cup as well, so you hold that, and we'll take them together.
one hand you hold the bread in the other hand you hold the cup you cannot have that appreciation of what Jesus did for us with one by itself they both go together because he came to identify with us of every part of our humanity but he came to be the ultimate and that was our redemption that means our purchase of our sin to wash him away thank the Lord, amen we are blessed by him Today, your expression of thanks will be as you take the elements. May you give God the praise for what he's done for you. Amen. Father, we thank you for what you did for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, as the children are dismissed to go to uh, Children's Church and Sunday School and getting ready for that, we're looking for some good days ahead, if I want to say here to that, to give you an idea of what's going on before we look at God's Word completely. Our young people are going to be as well away to all our adults for the next five years. I believe it's five years. We are, four years or five years? Four years. We are teaching a biblical worldview. We're not hearing it anywhere else. You need to hear what the Word of God says of the worldview because we're hearing so much from the pulpit and things of what God is wanting to speak to us about. And we have not been listening. We've been hearing the world talk, but we have not been listening to the Word of God. We feel it's important for our children. And then we, I'm going to say, a lot of us adults have been raised in a worldview that was not biblical. We might have been in church, maybe. But you weren't getting a biblical worldview. And I want you to understand that. If God wants us, and we as leadership, we feel it's important to start teaching. And even from the moment they show up in this world till the day they die. You die. We want to teach a biblical worldview. We... Some people say, well, that's not provable. Folks, you can talk about science all you want. You know what science has been doing? That's why I have more. They, as they said, in the last 10 years, there have been more scientists that have become followers of Christ than ever time in history. As you look at science, fact, why? Because they're saying the fact is what we have been saying all along cannot hold validity because something that you look as complex as even the protein in your body, which, by the way, you're made up of protein, it would take a year of what's just one class, intensive study, day after day, for hours on end, for you to even grasp the magnitude of the makeup of the protein that makes up our body. A recent man who is, was raised in four, at least five, maybe five generations of atheists, has now become a follower of Christ. Why is he a follower of Christ? Because he said, I was studying the protein, he's a chemist, and he studied it all and saw, and he said, after a while, I went, you know what? There has to be a greater being. There had to be a, a creator. And through that, he came to know Christ as his Savior. Folks, we have been living in the guise of a lie. It's time for us to hear the truth, that we were made with a design and purpose for the power and the glory of Christ to be expressed through us and to realize we have ultimate, complete value in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Because of him, we have it. So this morning, you have your Bibles. Turn to the book of 1 Kings 19. This morning I heard something rather interesting, just a passing moment, because as I drive 35 miles on the mornings when I come up here, I listen to Christian radio, because I just want to be my mind to be fed and be dwelt upon the Word of God, and Alan Jackson was preaching, and uh, Alan said, the fact is, I don't go to making me go, he said, I go to work out, and it goes to I work out does not make me an Olympic athlete nor walking through the produce department make me the person, the healthy person I should be. Would you all agree with that? No. Most of you walk through the produce department, go to the chip aisle, and we think we're having food, <laughs> and we're not. But the problem is we think that's, we go, well, that's does, that makes total sense. We don't go, we don't work out once and say, oh, we're, we're an Olympic athlete. No, we don't go through produce, produce department and think we have now got healthy diet, we're re eating properly. No, we don't do that. So why do we expect ourselves to show up on Sunday morning 
thinking that's going to make you the super Christian that you, and God will help you all the way through. It won't work. I'm sorry, folks. You say, well, what's the purpose of coming together? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, do not forsake the assembling yourselves, what? To provoke each other into love for who? Each other, but most of all for the Lord and to what? Good works. Not for our salvation, but because of our salvation. That's why we're looking at things and we'll be looking at things in the future of the church. We've got to be a church that's different. You know, we got challenged by a cowboy preacher about four, three years ago who said, your name is New Trail, then do things new. So let's be new. In Christ, this new how we do ministry, how we do those things. You know, I still, I'm amazed. And I want to say as a compliment to our ladies and, and, and men that help out at, uh, at our community meal. I, I think we're on, a, what, a five-week rotation right now, four to five weeks. You know what, this last time our church served 100, I believe it was 183, 189 individuals in our community of Abilene that are either living under bridges or they're just, home, or just destitute, in the fact is, or having struggles, and they just need a meal. You know what, praise God. And the fact is, that's putting the foot, feet to the gospel. I've had some people say, well, we're not sitting down with them all the time and talking about Jesus. You know what, first of all, you've got to feed them before they're ready to hear about Jesus. You know what? People don't listen well until you take care of their needs. They want to know their needs are met before they hear the gospel. And that's what we got to do. And we're doing that. And I thank the Lord for the ladies that are part of that and the men that have been part of that. It's awesome. It's great. It has caused some, dis I call some distress in our community. But I was going, it's a, I call it a good distress. Either they're committed to doing it or they're not committed to doing it. We're committed at New Trail to do that. Why? We're here to make a difference in the lives of people. That's why I'm about to preach what I'm doing this morning. Because it has to start at the grass roots. In 1 Kings, of all places, chapter 19, you look at scripture and you're going to think, what does this have to do about growth in the Lord and particularly of our walk with Him and how to be a people that God wants us to be? Well, I'll tell you what. I think you'll see it in just a little bit. 1 Kings 19, starting at verse 19. So it says this. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Sapphah, who was plowing, he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. And he said, then I'll come with you and go back. Elijah said, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burnt the plowing equipment to cook the meat and give it to the people. And they ate. And he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. A scripture that probably the most unlikely scripture you think about because you say, well, this really has to do like a preacher to a preacher or something like that. I'm going to tell you something. It's a lot deeper than that of what happened here. Elijah is going down the road. And his, his cloak or his mantle, they called the mantle, was on him. Mantle meant something to people in Israel. And the bottom line is he goes down the line at road and he sees Elisha and he throws his mantle or his cloak up on him. Now you probably think that's weird. That would be like somebody jumping, going down the highway, seeing Ray Marston on a tractor, jumping off, running over to Ray and getting inside his tractor and throwing a mantle on him saying, and, and, and Ray suddenly says, I'll follow. I'll do what God wants. And some of you say, well, we, first of all, you probably get run over by the tractor. Well, th that's beside the point. The point is this. It's, that, it's like, out of the clear blue, here it comes. But I want you to know something. There was a meaning to this. What was the meaning of the mantle? Let me just share with you. And I believe it relates to our everyday life as we think of, of growth groups that we want to see happening in our church. And we have happening, but we want to expand that. And that is, first of all, understand what the mantle meant. And you look in the Israel, it meant two things primarily. One, it is... Elijah was saying, Elisha, join the prophet's service. I, a calling. It's God's calling. I'm, I want you to know I'm placing that on you. We're giving blessing. You know, when I was called into the ministry, there was those who gathered around me that were other pastors, and they prayed for me and laid their hands on me and gave me God's blessing. Now, God gives his own blessing, but they were identifying that blessing and saying, we stand in heart with the Lord upon this. So it was that, but here's the other thing it meant. It was a call to understand, I'm adopting you. Now, that's interesting. The fact is, we know we have those in our church that are adopted. I have a family. We have my brother-in-law's adopted. Our daughter-in-law's adopted. We recognize adoption. The fact is a special 
there was somebody who wanted to say, essentially what they were doing is, we are throwing a mantle on you. We want you. Man, isn't that a beautiful thought? Think about that. That God says to us, he wants us. He's thrown his mantle through his son Jesus Christ on us and wants us. Boy, you're serious this morning. <whistles> Lighten up, folks. Hello. <sighs> Are you awake? Just checking. Are you all right? You with me? Yeah. Quit it, Stan. Get on with it. I know what you're saying. <laughs> Get this. We're seeing here that God says to us when he puts a mantle on us, that first of all, I want you for my service, but secondly, I wanted you because I want you to be mine. In a lot of the reasoning, I was reading some things from the Coptic Church. The Coptic Church is a famous church in Egypt particularly. And I was reading a bishop there, and he wrote these words about it. He said, we understand that what it was is when they were given adoption, the fact is that we look at Elijah. They said, look at Elijah. That G Elijah was looked at as being the example of God himself, and Elisha was that of humanity. Elijah was saying, saying, I want you. And what did Jesus do? He left heaven and came down to earth, and he said, I want you. Isn't that awesome? That God wants us that much. He gave us that identity. We said, well, that, what's that do with our growth? Well, I'll tell you something. If you're reading the rest of Scripture, you're reading particularly in 1 Samuel 10, chapter 19 of Sam, 1 Samuel, and then you read in 2 Samuel chapter 2, we read about those who are called the school of the prophets. And that means there was a prophet, there was, and Samuel started this, so he could teach young people how to walk and serve the Lord. It was meant sometimes in the tabernacle and to help in that area and those things, but to help them to know what they're supposed to be doing. This is young people. You know what? Let's face it, folks. We are focusing on young people right now in this church intentionally. You know why? Because we want them to grow up to be what God wants them to be because we have a responsibility because I'll guarantee you there's somebody out there that wants to take care of your children for you and it won't be the godly way. Are you with me? Let's face it. You look at 1933 when a man named Adolf Hitler came to power there. You know what his goal, one of his goals was? Is to take the young people and make them servants of the state, but not knowing they were the servants, we would treat them and give them all sorts of incentives to be part of the Hitler Youth Group. And all those things that happened, and guess what happened? They had a generation that became whatever I call puppets. They, whatever Hitler and the Nazi party declared, they did. And then you have people that went into the SS and became brutal murderers because they had been seared of any conscience of how they walk with God. Because you know why? Because even many pastors admitted that still survived and there were men that preached the word. They did not preach the word and did preach in such a way that called their people to accountability and to righteousness. And you know what happened? The fact is, some of them died. Some of them lived, but they lived with a conscience of understanding. We did not declare that what we were supposed to preach the word of God and call them and call sin, sin. When they saw Hitler come to power, they should have spoke up and didn't. I've already told you the story of Martin Neimuller, who had a meeting with some pastors after World War II, and they were blaming everything from the economy and everything else. And he went home and that night, and he was praying, said, God, what was the problem? Why did this happen in our country? And God spoke to him and said, did I not, you in early 1933, give you an audience with Adolf Hitler? Yes. And he said, did you speak my name and talk to him about me, to him? And he said, no, I did not. And God took him back. Now, God didn't hammer him down, but he realized, he said, I had to come broken and say, God, I've sinned as a pastor and I wounded the, my country because I was not the man of God I was supposed to be you know it's not easy calling people out on sin or conduct that might not be very holy it's not easy but we got to be people that stand up and as you as followers of Christ it isn't just my pa your pastor needs to do that we as a people are called to speak but where does it happen how do we learn? How do we know to stand up? It starts in the small area of called home groups. You say, starts there? Yeah. I don't, you know, Sunday morning, you know what I'm doing? I'm just wetting your appetite for more of God's word. That's all I'm doing, just wetting your appetite. I always told you before, it's like when some cattle don't want to eat, you know what? You put a little molasses on the food, meat, and make them want to eat it because it's sweet and they want it. I hope that we understand today, God wants you to be part of this. So God has come and he's put his mantle on us. But then we see the school of prophets, which we see that Samuel started, and then there was a time of apostasy, and then Elijah came along and re resurrected, and there was three places where they, if you read in chapter 2 of 2 Kings, that there were three places. One was Bethel, 
Gilgal, and I forgot the other one right now. But you see there that where the Elijah went, went after the call of God upon Elisha, we see that where he went, Elisha said, I want to go there too. And he did, and we'll see then what happened. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But I want to point out some principles from this passage of Scripture that we just read. Number one, we've got to understand something. When we are in home groups, you know what we learn to do? We learn how to give up ourselves for Christ. How to give up ourselves. Our young adults recently went through a video series called Not a Fan. We probably need to see it again. <laughs> because I don't think we catch all the principles of it for the first time. But we saw the fact is it's not a bad matter of coming to be a fan and sit in church and hear a preacher and hear good worship and everything else, which I think 90% of our churches are doing today, if not more in America. We're just kind of caught up in the, oh, it's a wonderful thing. When we're called to get to points of things that are painfully close to home, that to realize, man, it's not where I should be with God. I have to give up myself. And if, met, you know, and if you see the story there, is you see ultimately what happens is this gentleman who has a heart attack and he comes from face to face with reality of who he is and what he needs to be doing for Christ. And he starts doing it and the rest of the family is having a problem accepting it, including his wife. They eventually get the grasp of the principles of what he's teaching as he suddenly, again, has a heart attack and dies from it. But the idea is this, the man in the journey understand to give up things. Now you say, what's that mean? Well, I'll tell you what, let's look at Elisha. Remember, he has the mantle put on him. And what's he doing? He's plowing 12 pairs of oxen. Hello, folks, that's a lot, isn't it? Which means he's probably a man or a, came from a family of great wealth. See, the problem is when we people come from wealth, we have a problem of letting go of things, don't we? I earned that. And God says, no, you've got to surrender it to me. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? What did he say to him? Give up all you have, give it to who? The poor, and then what did he say? And follow me. And what happened? The man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We see here in this passage here that somehow God was getting a hold of Elisha, and he see here he gave it up. And how did he give it up? He took the, the yoke, he took that which could burn, and he took the oxen, and he fed people. He gave up what was his symbol of power, a symbol of affluence. He gave it up. God's calling us in home groups. You say, what happens in home groups? Is we get to be intimate with Jesus and with each other and saying, hey, where's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Some of you don't want that. You know why? Because you don't want to get that close to God to get that close to your heart. That's painful to say. <laughs> Some of you don't want that God to get that close to your heart. Because the more God shows us our heart, what it is, the more painful it is. But yet in the end, there's healing. I want to tell you something. Recently, I put a sliver in my finger. I thought I pulled it out. I did. There's a problem. Part of it didn't come with it. And guess what I had to do? It's called go digging. <laughs> called digging. It wasn't comfortable. And then on top of all, it was kind of hard working my left hand because I'm not real good with my left hand. And then I called my wife in. Oh, she loves doing that. <laughs> it's painful, isn't it? When it oh. But I had to be done because you know what? It was causing me problems. That's what happens in home groups when we're together or wherever you meet. If you're McDonald's, we want to see God do this anywhere. But we meet together, what? To learn how to give up, just like Elisha did when the mantle is him. Because God, if you don't know, claim Jesus Christ, you have been given a mantle to be his servant. Because he desired you and he adopted you. Now guess what? He's saying, give up your rights to be mine. Oh, <laughs> When you kept, accept Jesus Christ, you're giving up yourself. Let's face it. How well were you doing on your own? Come on. How many were doing so well on your own? You can't do it on but were we trying? We sure were, weren't we? <laughs> Man, have we tried so often. And the problem is we come to know Christ and we give it up, but still Satan comes along and says, you know what? Okay, all right. So you gave yourself to Jesus. But you know, this part of your life, or that's part of your life, you cannot handle, he can't handle it. You need to handle that. Boy, don't we do that? Don't we hear the voice of the liar saying that to us? 
The fact is, I cannot make it. I need to handle this. I got to do what I can. And the whole time, God says, can you give up the authority? Can you give up your power that you think you have? In other words, we need to come to a sense of giving ourselves up to him. And this is what Elisha did. He gave up himself. He gave up all those things, including, you notice, I didn't say anything about marriage here, so I guess we're okay. He must have been single yet. Bottom line is, he says, he said, let me go say goodbye to my mother and father, and I'll follow you. Remember when Jesus said, you know what Jesus did? There was a time he said, there was some said, let's go take care of this. He said, uh, why do that? Follow me. Because it's kind of a rhetorical question when you see Elijah says, go back. What have I done to you? In other words, think about it. Hmm. It's okay. It's up to you what you want to do. But I still want you. And so Elisha, he gives up himself by burning the equipment to serve, to cook the beef, the oxen, which that was a lot of beef, folks. He says it fed, fed the people. Say, who was it? I'm just thinking he's feeding the neighborhood. When you become a follower of Christ and God lays his mantle on you, you're called to learn how to give up yourself to be a totally obedient to Christ. You need it. I need it. I think I see sometimes when I see in our church we have this person here but not this person this person or maybe it might be a husband or wife and it might be something you're going through and some people might think well I just not, that's, that's not my thing guess what it might not be your thing but it's what you're going to need thing I don't always like being in a small group because sometimes it gets painful for me yes for your pastor but I realize then when it's painful there's some surgery going on that God wants to do some things and correct because then it puts me back together in a good way. In a holy way. A healing way. And I'm not here caught myself in a way of saying the fact is, well, I'm trying to be doing my own surgery. I'll be honest with you. And let, even when you're, like I told you about the splinter, I'm sorry. If I'm wounded over here, I don't do well of healing myself over here. I have to let somebody else come do the healing for me. Amen? Amen. That's what the Lord does for us. And that's why we come together. We need each other to challenge each other. And then what Elijah was saying to Elisha, said, I put my yoke upon you, my cloak. I put it on you. I want you because I adopted you. And I want you to you you be part of the prophet service. You say, well, that's, I'm not a prophet. Well, I'll tell you something. You read all through Scripture. We're all called. It says in Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all people groups that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's our responsibility. As a church, I'm passionate that we get into, have everyone part of a home group. We got to be. Because you don't grow from today. It might give you some spark. But the spark should be passionate in the flame. And the flame happens both in your private time with the Lord, but also with those who can challenge you and encourage you. And how do you encourage each other? Oh, by the way, let me tell you, will you what God show me from his word as we go through? Let me share this with you. Ah. Ah. I get it. Or it might be, I never saw that before. And right at that moment, it speaks to where you need to be. Be spoken to. But also we understand. <laughs> Simply this. We learn to serve. As much as a, bro- a friend of mine went and fell to great sin and made national news almost 16 years ago, 17 years ago. That was Ted Haggard. One thing about that church, though, they understood there at New Life Church in Colorado Springs. Is they knew how to serve. They have home groups and, ho- and their small groups or whatever, they, I forgot what they call them. doesn't matter. They had one group just well, through one lady they had to keep breaking it off and off, and she finally had to have somebody else, other people come who learned that we were skilled in guitars. But also, she was teaching people how to play guitar, but then that was a Bible study group, and they learned how to serve. And they used their ministry of music, their music in the service in the community to share Jesus Christ. But here's the thing they did. When somebody died, and if somebody in the community didn't have a church home, you know what they did? This home group, might be who was closest to it, moved in. I call it like, I call them holy vultures in a good sense. Holy vultures. You know what they did? They moved in. 
They brought meals. They brought food. They brought plates. They brought everything. And they all on top of all, you know what they did? At the funeral home, they made sure that there was plenty of handkerchiefs and Kleenex and everything. For the they did everything that there could be done to minister to those families. And I remember I heard my good friend, who I want to get here, one of the associate pastors, still there, Mel Waters. Mel said, he said, we had one time where one man in this hardened family didn't, didn't, God was so far from that family, and his words were simply this, I didn't know a church could do this. <laughs> Shows how effective the church had not been, I'm speaking generally, but here a church made a difference. And it all started in a home group. Could the whole new, new, tri a new life do it? No. But that home group could, that group that was discipling each other, and he challenged each other, and guess what? I will tell you about that one story, the one that Mel told me about. Every one of those members that he, they came in contact came to know Jesus Christ and are still a vital part, as I heard recently, of New Life Church yet to this day. And that was 20 years ago. Folks, that's what it's about. But I also talk about home groups being very much answerable within the body of Christ. There has to be that responsibility so we can keep account of helping each other, encouraging us. Because as one dear brother once said, the fact is the greatest danger is a home group that's on its own. Because it becomes Satan can know how to make more divisions there. You got to be holy after God and let themselves be accountable. Hmm. The third thing we see, we have to be hungry enough to stay in God's presence through his word. You have your Bibles now, turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. Just a few pages over. As you read this passage of Scripture in 2 Kings, what do we read here? We read that the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, and the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha. And asked, do you not know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Let me pause here. Notice here, here's one of the schools of the prophets, that they call them. It was in Bethel. Each place he was, a prophet, that was started by Elijah. He went there to minister to him. He said, yes, I know, said Elisha, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, surely as the Lord lives and says, as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of prophets at Jericho went up from Elijah and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know. He replied, be, So be quiet. You know, it's kind of his way of saying, I don't want to deal with reality. <laughs> then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. He replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went, walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went out and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I take, I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha said. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. You see, if you see me when I'm taken up from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried not out, My father, my father. Let me pause right there. Remember what I told you about the cloak, the mantle? It was that of adoption. What did Elisha cry out? My father, my father. He was like a son to him. This is my, this is my spiritual daddy goes on the chariots and fire, horsemen of Israel and Elisha saw him no more and then he took up his garment and tore it in two I want to stop there just for a second I'll finish in just a moment but I want you to know something we have to hunger to stay in God's presence through his word I want to tell you something what did Elisha want he wanted that presence to be with Elijah because he knew he was learning what God wanted him to learn through him you know what we need to be in home groups that we can learn is because we we're challenged. We're called to count. Have you been in the Word since the last time? Have you been faithful in the Word? And that helps courage us. But then when somebody says, yeah, let me tell you what God showed me. I've gotten several phone calls over the last months from individuals and said, they asked a question or they said, I've been reading this in the Bible. 
And I want to be sure I have this understood. You know what I like about that? They've been in the Word. <laughs> and secondly, they want to be sure that they're taking the understanding in the proper context. And that's God, that they're feeling what God's saying to them. Is this right on? You know what? We do that where? In growth groups. We challenge each other. We grow in each other. In that. So what do we see with Elisha three times when Elijah says, you stay here. Elisha says, uh-uh, I'm going with you. You know what? It should be when we have home groups and still growth groups, wherever. I don't care if you meet in McDonald's or wherever you're at. But if you're there, guess what? You're there passionately seeking God because you're hungry for more of Him through the body of Christ. I know of a young home group there. This young couple was part of it. And one in their group was a staff of this large church. And after a while, one day this person said to this husband of this couple, you kind of think differently. You're kind of outside the box. And it was qualified somewhat. And when this church made a step forward to really hump, go after and develop their church and their church of several thousand and really develop it into home groups and growth groups and really keep people in the word. In fact, the pastor's word, we want to see 110% involvement in the church. And this young couple, particularly the husband, was asked to be part of this. And he was part of a team. And what happened is God used it. And, and finding out through time, this person was instrumental of re-articulating how to promote that within the body of Christ. They only had at the time when they started, they were a church of about close to 2,000. At the time, they had like 250 to 300 in home groups and hope for growth groups, whatever you want to call them. I'll tell you something. When they, the pastor preached a series, they re -re promoted it, they re wanted people to be part of it, and they had a special calling and a special Sunday. The church by this time was going up toward 3,000. They had over 50% response to want to be part of home groups because there was hunger created to be in the Word of God and to encourage each other. You say, well, how does this fit with Elijah? Elijah, well, get this. Elijah says, hey, this is what God does to us. He puts the mantle on us. And we see Elisha, what's he do? He gives everything up to follow. But he was also willing to serve, because that's what he did. He spread others. He served them. And we saw he was willing to stay in God's presence because he hungered to be in his word or in the presence of his word. That's what God wants of us. Quite frankly, Four things should be this. We should want the blessing of God. You say, in home group? Well, you know what? In home groups or home growth groups, whatever you want to call them, I'm, I keep saying that back and forth. I'll tell you something. It's there where we can give the blessing, and blessing is many ways. God's favor of how he wants to encourage us to grow to be like him and the more we learn about him the more we hunger the more we hunger the more we find out how much we've been missing out and how much I have an appetite for more God wants us to grow in him because what do we read here we do the next verse I st where I stopped at and where did I go then Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen to him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan he took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, he divided the right into the left, and he crossed over. And the company of the prophet from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. They went out to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, We, your servants, have fifty able men. Let them go and look for your servant, master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down the high mountain in some valley. No, he said, Don't send them. But they persisted, so he let him go. After so many days, they, three days, they re did not find him. They returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, and he said, didn't I tell you not to go? Well, I mean, he knew where he went. But the idea is this. He wanted to be sure that he had the blessing of God. You know what I want? I want the blessing of God. Because I'm willing to grow to be like him. But you know who helps me grow? You do. Through his word. We're called to do that. We need each other. The challenge over the next couple weeks will be to be part.
part of some home groups. And by the way, it's not for you to be the boss in there. It's for you to learn from others through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. That means be quiet and listen and then talk as appropriate. It means for all of us. Yes. I tell you what. Can I say it this way? My heart for you is that we all become part of the school of prophets. I know we're under grace. This is an Old Testament. But I think you understand what I'm saying. Through God's wonderful son, he put a mantle on us. His salvation that we accept. But he wants us to grow into the knowledge and revelation of who he is. And to grow in his likeness. That's what God's called us to do. That's why even as we look and we're wanting to rebuild our, our team group, you know what? They're going to come together for a moment, but they're going to be divided into groups. You know why? Middle school girls, high school boys, high school girls, middle school boys. We want leaders over them. You know why? We want them to learn how to walk with Jesus, how to be one-on-one. -on -one. I'll guarantee you, a girl doesn't want to say some things she's going through in front of a bunch of guys. But she needs the maturity of somebody there with them to guide them and help them to encourage them to walk with Jesus Christ. Because they'll speak one to another. And you know what? My girl might say, you know what? I've been there. But this is what Jesus has done for me. What's that do? It helps us to give up ourselves helps us to know how to learn to serve because so often we're pretty selfish and I'm not going to speak this about the girls, I'm speaking about all of us we sometimes have to realize how selfish we've been and we have to be prompted by others to we're called to serve for Christ that we will hunger for him more that we would know his blessing upon us the days ahead are great for new trails there's a world out there hungry. There's a lot of people of late. I, I want you to know, I close with this. I got the surprise of my life this past week. On Thursday, I went down to Council Grove to pay for my tags. A young lady, of course, like they're doing all courthouses, all public places now. You got the new, they just now put up a shield. And you got a little mic to speak through, even though you can spark right on the top of it. <laughs> and here's a young lady serving me. But I knew the lady over here serving another customer. And she turned and said, I hear you're going on a long vacation. <laughs> this is the county treasurer's office saying, they know I'm going on a vacation. I should have told them, yeah, my church wants to shoot me and send me to heaven. I guess I'm going on a long vacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, excuse me? She goes, yeah, a long vacation. She said, uh, I said, how did you find out? I'm really going on a sabbatical, I said. She said, well, I want you to know, I found you from your church online. And if I'm doing this right now, she might be watching this morning. I'm going to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but it really spoke to me. That isn't the same as being one-on-one, -on -one, but the bottom line is we don't know who God's look reaching out to. And they need to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. The encouragement is there, and I thought, here in Morris County, when I know we have people around the nation watching us, and I thought to myself, the person I didn't expect to hear from, and she's turned around and said, I'm your own vacation. But thank the Lord, I always say it sets the bait for what God wants to do in a home groups. In heart, you know, that's where it happens. By the way, it's where we can be confident, uh, be confidential to one another. That's why we don't want groups to be taller, smart, larger than 10. You know why? We lose a sense of confidentiality. We want there to be intimacy and caring and building each other. And you say, well, I'm not sure I'm a leader. You can be a facilitator, can't you? Facilitate and guide. It's amazing how God raises up leadership out of facilitators. <laughs> this morning, I'm encouraged at what God is doing through New Trail. But we can only go as deep as we allow ourselves to be deepened
by investing ourselves where we have one-on-one, -on -one, like the early church did in Acts chapter 2, building each other in Christ and saying, God, I realize I'm in the school of prophets. Help me to grow. Because the prophets learned how to learn, the, understand the law of Moses. They understood how sacred music and sacred history were important and how they applied it into their walk and teaching people. That's what God's calling us to do as we look at God's word, isn't it? We're looking at the whole counsel of God. We're looking at what? How music is used to praise Him. We're looking at history and how God wants us to be people that make a difference, that change the history of others for Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. It has to start one-on-one. -on -one. I'll say that. Because somebody said, what if we have, with our young people, what if we only have one teen in that area for a time? Guess what? Nothing like unhindered attention <laughs> about who they are in Christ. That's what we want to see in each of us for the glory of Christ. The challenge will come even more next week as we look about being part of home groups and let ourselves be God's people to grow like Him. Let's pray. And now, Lord, we allow ourselves, Lord, we want to be allowed to be Elisha's. Recognizing the mantle's been put on, on us, we have the grace and the salvation of Jesus Christ. But it's not meant to be kept to ourselves, it's meant to be shared with others. May as a church we grow because we have been putting ourselves in investment one on one with each other for the glory of Christ. We love and we praise you for your goodness and faithfulness to us. May we seek you with all the passion of our heart as we love each other in an intimate group that reflects the character of Christ. We want to be obedient, servants, passionate for your word, to know the blessing of God. In Jesus' name. Let's share together the, the final word that we're called to be as a church. We're serving the Western heritage culture of the Smoky Valley region by reaching the uncommitted for Christ. Let's go rock the world for him. <laughs>